Hi there. It's Rob Arnfield speaking to you from Western University. And today I'd like to talk to you about an approach to the difficult to scan patient. In particular, we're going to focus today on imaging the ICU patient who has difficult echo windows. And this will be both be a tutorial in physical technique as well as in psychology of scanning these sometimes demoralizing patients. So we will use a case example today to drive home some very important points. So we're gonna start in the parasternal long axis. My index mark you see is pointing towards the patient's right shoulder in the third to fourth intercostal space. And when the probe is placed on the patient's chest, we see exactly what we don't wanna see. We're seeing lung artifact instead of a heart and we're seeing rib shadows. So how do you approach this situation? Well, my approach to the situation is to rapidly evaluate whether or not there is any neighboring acoustic windows in another physical location on the patient's chest. Now I say rapid because time is of the essence in the situation. We ultimately are care providers who have other responsibilities to this patient to initiate care plans and to evaluate other details uh, other than just cardiac function. And in addition to being rapid, it is very important to be systematic because often what you see in the novice in this scenario is you move one space up, one space down, maybe back one space up again. You keep looking around in the same spots and ultimately you fail to prove one way or the other whether or not an acoustic window exists. And as a novice, this can be particularly deflating or troublesome because the question in every novice's mind when they can't generate an acoustic window is, is this a me problem because I'm a novice or is this a patient problem? And the tendency when you're a novice is that it's a you problem. And that can be damaging to the psyche of the novice and frankly discouraging for them to continue taking up point of care echo, which is a loss to uh, their clinical armamentarium. So I'm gonna show you what I do for the parasternal long axis or really just the parasternal windows I'm sure other people do it as well, but is a simple method of running the probe in a uh, sort of a snail shell, gradually increasing radial circles from my initial starting point, all the while looking at the screen for the sudden flash of an acoustic window or the presence of a heart. And we'll see this uh, demonstrated here now. So I see no acoustic window. I'm gonna kind of move around in a circular fashion, all the while looking at the screen, I've cleared now the entire, almost anterior chest, and at no point on the screen do I see anything other than dense lung artifact and rib shadow. So this is a highly efficient and unfortunately non-reassuring maneuver for the parasternal space. I now, novice or expert, am confident that barring significant changes in patient position, which we'll get to later, uh, that this patient has no acoustic windows. That took about 10 seconds, and when it's time to tell my findings to the team or to describe what I saw, uh, I simply can say the patient has no peristernal windows and move on rather than uh, saying something to the effect of, I couldn't get any peristernal views. I know for certain this patient has no peristernal windows. You saw it and I saw it. So have a systematic approach to clearing the parasternal space. I like the snail shell approach. And uh, if you do see the heart pop onto the screen, then you've solved the biggest problem. You have matched an acoustic window with your desired view, and you can look on at smaller details, smaller probe movements to manipulate uh, your, your window. Now, the apical view is traditionally very difficult to get in these kind of patients as well, and perhaps uh, is even more important to have a systematic approach. Now, my colleague, uh, Dr. Pierre Corey, full uh, attribution to him, is the one who taught me this technique, which I quite like. Again, I haven't seen it described anywhere else, and so it may be that others are doing it also. But in the apical plane, you'll recall that for the apical floor chamber, the index mark should point towards about two or three o'clock uh, on the patient's torso. And uh, generally, we think about the apical four chamber being around the nipple on a male fifth or sixth intercostal space in the um, sort of lateral anterior axillary line or so, the lateral chest wall. And uh, often what we do here is I see people put their probe in this location and they just kind of swirl around in this location and they can't find the window and they get discouraged and they move on. 
the reality is the acoustic window potential for the uh, apical four chamber we have seen and everyone who's done enough scanning has a seen can really embody an entire kind of box or square on the chest wall uh, depending on the uh, cardiac uh, orientation for the patient. So the key thing is to acknowledge for the apical that the windows exist between the rib spaces. It cannot exist on a rib, but between the rib spaces. Therefore, to clear this space efficiently, we try this sort of C-shaped approach where we draw a C across the patient's chest, starting in uh, almost an absurdly posterior kind of mid-axillary line or posterior axillary line, and you run the probe uh, in the typical apical position with the index mark pointing to 2 or 3 o'clock and the face of the probe pointing slightly cranially, and you run it in those rib spaces and clear the entire space. So let's see what we get here. So you see I'm uh, picking up some additional gel. I've got my index mark. It's going to go up to about 2 or 3 o'clock. And I've got rib shadow, or sorry, a lung artifact there. And I'm just going to clear that space. I'm, my face is pointing slightly cranial. I come, I go from absurdly posteriorly to absurdly anteriorly. And I'm clearing all the different interspaces, all the while looking at the ultrasound screen. And I either see some combination of rib shadow or lung artifact the entire time I'm doing this. And I've gone oh, so far as the nipple line and still no acoustic window. So this, again, takes about 10 or 15 seconds and rapidly with very few curse words uh, or blood, sweat, and tears, I've simply determined this patient has no apical acoustic windows. Disappointing as that may be, it now liberates me to pursue um, the last major site of acoustic windows, which is, of course, the subcostal space, and we'll see what that brings next. One thing I will say that is when you find patients such as this uh, gentleman uh, who have no peristernal windows, uh, often uh, there's a appropriate shift of the heart uh, down caudally, and that's why they have no peristernal windows. And what that typically means is they have a, a decent or if not excellent subcostal window. So let's see what the subcostal space looks like and see how we can maximize the views we can get from the subcostal space. So here we go, probe on the chest, and we can see here that the subcostal window is in fact very, very good. And we see all four chambers quite well and can make comments regarding pericardial effusion, right heart function, left heart function, and uh, even if we were so interested, which uh, we would be in this case, uh, to apply color Doppler to evaluate valve uh, function integrity, uh, we could do that as well. One of the things, though, we often comment on is that we don't like to make uh, conclusions in a single view. So here we may consider the RV a little bit dilated, and we may consider the LV to be mild to moderately depressed in this patient. And it's tough, though, sometimes to make strong conclusions in one view. As one of my colleagues, Dr. Scott Millington, likes to say, that one view is merely a hypothesis, and we can't make real strong conclusions of one view. So the key thing for you here, and what I'd like to emphasize, is how do you get the most views out of a single acoustic window like this? And I hope many of you are starting to embrace, if you haven't already, the subcostal short axis view, which is ultimately a perfect substitute for the parasternal short axis, which is an ideal view for interpretation of LV function because we get our all four walls of the ventricle at the mid-ventricular level. So let's see how we do that. So we're happy with our four chamber. We agree the LV looks sluggish. The RV looks a little dilated. No pericardial effusion to speak of, nothing meaningful. And but, However, what I did here is I tipped my index mark towards the patient's head, and from that position, I've now captured the left ventricle in a short axis view at the papillary muscle level. This will allow for a more uh, detailed analysis of the four walls of the ventricle. And in my opinion, we certainly have uh, depressed LV function with limited endocardial excursion or thickening throughout. Here you can see the ease with which from the same plane with the index mark pointing towards the patient's head, we can capture the IVC view. So now three views out of the same acoustic window. And uh, we can see here in keeping with the dilated right ventricle, we see an unwavering IVC. Switching between the different planes in the short axis merely involves uh, tilting the transducer from left to right. And you can see you can take different cuts through the heart, including a pulmonary artery view, a mitral valve view, and all the way back to the fork chamber view if we bring our index mark back towards the kind of two to three o'clock uh, position. So in summary, relieve your suffering by systematic exhaustion of acoustic windows. None of this small movement, well, a little bit this way, a little bit that way. When you have no acoustic window, you have a serious problem. 
and you need to relieve this by making serious efforts and serious motor movements. Smaller, finer movements are required when you have an acoustic window to optimize your image, but when you have no acoustic window, a systematic, broad, sweeping movements are the way to go. When you have an acoustic window, maximize your yield in these difficult to image patients. And lastly, as I mentioned, body position changes uh, are not always practical in the critically ill, but when available to you in this situation, consider them. Namely, left lateral decubitus position, which in this patient, uh, you'll be pleased to know if you put him in steep lateral decubitus, parasternal windows become available to you. So again, efficiency and morale sparing approaches for you here. I hope that's helpful as you prepare to begin your pathway towards image acquisition as a novice or looking for pointers to refine it as a intermediate or expert. I hope this is helpful and we'll talk to you again later.